and we are recording. So this is going to be a video talking through the first tutorial and giving a bit of a solution to the code and running some of the tools that we talk about. Um, there might be a few places where I digress a little and talk about solutions students came up with in the tutorials or try and elaborate on a few different things. Um, forgive me, uh, but it, on the other hand, it might also mean that even if you've done the exercise, there might be bits of the video that you want to skim around and that might still be useful to you. Um, first thing is to give the background to the tutorial. So uh, in case uh, you're catching up with this a little bit later on, um, in the first week we introduced Scala as a language, but we had only been talking about imperative programming so far. We haven't introduced functional programming yet. So in this tutorial, uh, we're going to do some programming exercises, but not worried about doing them in a functional style yet. Uh, though, as we will see, it will be a lot easier to solve many of these problems using a functional style. Uh, right, so let's, let's get on with this. Now, I'm going to skip some of the installation stuff because, well, I've already got these things all installed in my on my computer. And I'm also going to skip this part about the dreaded firewall because I'm not working on, tutor on Turing for this. I'm working on my laptop. So instead, let's jump straight down to, to get the tutorial. And we'll pop, first of all, across to the repository on GitHub. And so there it is. And we can see in the file listing um, some of the files that uh, we talk about in the tutorial. So down here, I, I refer to sbtlaunch.jar and that is here and that is a little jar file which contains a, a launcher it knows how to go out to the internet and get the correct version of the Scala build tool I say the correct version and that's because if we have a look in project there is a file here called build.properties and in build.properties I have said uh, this uses SBT version 0.13.13 and so that is the version that the launcher is going to go and try and get and this one here that's a script for running the launcher on um, Linux or on OS X and this one here is the one for Windows now I'm not doing this on Windows so uh, well I'm, I'm hoping that will work for you on Windows it's a it's a fairly standard one from the internet um, but I haven't actually personally been able to check uh, to test sbt.bat. All right, let's go get this. Um, let's go and get this. Now it says here git clone https. Uh, that's going to ask me for my username and password very often. Uh, it shouldn't for you because you're you're not logged in. Let's. I, I'm going to use the SSH version uh, just because I'm set up to be able to uh, edit code in this repository as well. So git clone and let's go and get the content of the repository takes a moment and okay and so now I have a directory called first steps on my computer and if I cd into it and I have a little look by the power of git that there now looks very much like that there um, so there are, you know, build.spt, build.spt, project, uh, project. Uh, .gitignore isn't showing up. For those of you who might be a little bit new to Unix, that's because um, anything with a dot at the beginning is treated as being a hidden directory and won't turn up with a normal ls command. You have to say ls minus a to get it to show it. All right, let's keep going on the tutorial. Uh, so the next thing I say to do is to run the SBT launcher script and uh, because I'm on Mac that is the SBT one if you're on Windows it's sbt.bat now the first time you do this it's going to need to go and fetch SBT 0.13.13 uh, uh, but in my case I've already got it and so it'll be a little bit quicker for me and as soon as we've done that uh, this now goes to a command prompt, an interactive prompt inside the Scala build tool, and I'm going to run the test command. When I packaged the code up and loaded it onto GitHub, uh, as well as the main source code for the tutorial, uh, which is in here, main Scala cost 250 first steps, I also included some unit tests in here. And these are written, well, we will see about this particular style of programming later on uh, it's a, what's called a domain specific language 
um, but these are tests on your code and at the start of it all of these tests should be failing uh, but when we run the test we also see some stuff being printed out at the top and that is from some printlands in my code uh, so let's now jump back to the tutorial instructions again uh, so the next thing I said to do was all right we've run a command inside the Scala build tool how do we get out of the Scala build tool and uh, the one that's going to show up on the screen if I type it is if I type exit uh, but I could also do Control D uh, on Mac or Control C is the, the quit one and that will also uh, will also quit. Okay, next up, run IntelliJ. So let's go and run IntelliJ. I happen to have a slightly old version of IntelliJ on my computer at the moment. Uh, I'll probably update that during term, um, but the recent versions will all work pretty much the same. Now, let's go and open this up and we'll open the one that I cloned, not the one from when I was writing it. Uh, now let's pop down so wbilling source code teaching cosc 250 there it is where I was writing it but let's go down to tutorial demos where I just cloned it and let's open it and we can see it's got the, the, the little Scala icon it's recognized this is going to be a, um, a, a, a an SBT project but so I want the directory that contains build.sbt in here, it's going to ask me for a project SDK. If you are running IntelliJ for the first time and you've not yet set up um, uh, uh, an SDK, uh, you would need to click New, pick a JDK, pick a version of Java 8. And uh, if you're on Turing, I recommend picking the Oracle one that is in um, slash opt slash JDK. And the reason for that is that if you're on a Red Hat based Linux operating system, um, the version of OpenJDK that comes with the Red Hat ones at the moment doesn't include the JavaFX libraries, which we might want to use in some future tutorials if we want to throw a little GUI up on screen. And so just to make sure we have less chance of tripping over that problem, uh, later on I kind of keep recommending, well, just pick the Oracle one that does include it. Uh, on almost every other platform, however, OpenJDK also does include um, JavaFX, I believe. Um, but so the, the main thing is just to pick a Java 8 one. OK, let's then click OK. Uh, it will building first steps SBT project in info in a moment it'll ask me which projects I want to open uh, I'm just talking over the top of it while it does stuff at the moment working 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 here we go and so it's gonna say what do I want to include in the project I'm just gonna say okay to that and here we go let's make that bigger um, now, if this is your first time in IntelliJ, uh, this space here, this is where editor panes are going to open. This over here, this is the project pane, a little like a file explorer, except it's recognizing what things are. Uh, the source code, if we open source, there's main and there's test. So the unit tests that I've delivered are in here and the main code is in here. Now. Other bits of IntelliJ you might care about, there is a little button in the bottom left hand corner um, which amongst other things toggles whoops, these things around the edge. And these things around the edge are different panels that are related to different activities. So there's an SBT panel uh, which we don't need to use at the moment but that little button there can tell it to reload um, the project and you might find occasion to use that sometimes uh, so we'll just know that it's there but we'll keep it closed for the moment uh, down here however I can also open a terminal and I can run stuff right from there now next thing I'm going to do I'm going to put this into presentation mode just in case you are watching this in a slightly lower resolution um, so that uh, you can see everything I'm doing and so then I'm going to need to go view tool windows and get my terminal back. OK, so hopefully that is now all visible. And let's open the step one code. And up here uh, we can see the prints uh, that I was putting in. You can also see the multi-line string uh, format for Scala. So Scala, you can put multi-line strings by using three quotes to begin it, three quotes to end it. and um, 
to lay things out a little bit neatly, you can do this convention where if you put uh, a, a pipe symbol at the beginning and then call strip margin at the end, uh, what you'll be left with is this part. And so that lets you deal with the fact that um, you'd like your string to be indented so it's all readable in your code, but you don't necessarily want the indenting to turn up in your string. Um, okay. Let's pop back here. So what did I say to do next? Exploring IntelliJ, well, I've sort of done a bit of that for you. Um, let's now go down here and let's, well, let's run SBT from the terminal. And let's run test. And this should behave very much as it did on the uh, command line, sure enough. Uh, but if we go up here, so there is that print in our object step one, and there it is being printed out. And so, um, and here in exercise one, I, I starts out as one. That's coming from down here. Um, so we, we, we'll talk a little bit about how Scala allows object-oriented code as well. Um, object means, okay, I'm defining an object and there is only ever going to be one of these and it is this one. Uh, so this is a singleton object. There is precisely one object called step one uh, in the entire program. Uh, it's not a class that we can instantiate multiple times. There's just one of it. Um, the code normally, you know, outside of any me method definitions, uh, this code's all going to get called uh, when the object is initialized, effectively, as part of the constructor. And so that is why these println's are going to turn up before the output of our failing tests. And it's because that stuff has been run when this object was being initialized, which it had to be before those tests could run to call the methods that they're calling. All right, so let's now start um, doing, and I'm, I'm going to close the project window a little bit. Uh, oh, actually, before I do, before I do, the next thing I said to do, um, let's quit out of this SBT, um, because let's use the fact that this IDE is smart and knows, for instance, that, it, that how to run unit tests uh, to run our unit test a little bit differently. So I've just right clicked on first step spec and if I go run first step spec uh, this is going to open me a different window but it's going, it should do all the building, realize that this is a, um, a unit test script and it should give me a little UI that's particular to running unit tests. And here it is, instantiating tests and so we should see that the test results, we've got some tests that are failing. Uh, but again, when we, um, uh, when we have a look at the output, uh, we can see our print lens at the top. And I'm going to leave that there because now I can hit this little button here for rerunning my tests, uh, test script uh, as I do some coding. Uh, and so then I'm going to close this to give myself a little bit more space in the window for typing code. So exercise one, basic syntax. And so this starts off repeating some of the stuff from the lecture saying about vowels and vars. And uh, we can also see in here Scala's string interpolation format. We can see that if I put an S before a string, uh, then I can start putting dollar something or other in there. Um, if I wanted to do printout I plus one, oh, we'll notice that that's been colorized as being part of the string. Uh, that's because if I want it to be part of the expression that's being inserted, I need to wrap it in a block, wrap it in curly braces. Um, but so that is just a kind of, you know, it's a handy thing to be able to format string outputs. And that is Scala's very convenient string interpolation format. All right, so let's try changing I to three and see what happens. So let's uncomment this line and sure enough, we get reassignment to val, squiggly line, it's not gonna work. Uh, if I try and rerun it, I should get a compile error. Uh, oh, it didn't hit save, but never mind. Uh, it auto saved when I went to try and run it. Reassignment to val, that ain't gonna work. Okay, uh, and oops, I'm gonna need to reopen my project window to um, be able to rerun that next time. Okay. Uh, sorry, that closed the pane that I needed. So let's re-comment that. 
And now if we change this one, var x is zero, oops, that should say x, shouldn't it? x is three and print it out. And if I now run that one, Here we go, x is now 3. Uh, that works perfectly happily. Uh, so vowels can't be changed, vars can. Down here, recapping method definitions. Well, here we have twice as a, as a method, and it takes a parameter that's an int, and it's going to return an int. So that's the, um, the type annotation going after a colon. And we notice the equals to say that um, uh, to say it equals the result of this expression and we haven't had to put a return keyword in because it's expression oriented so this block evaluates to two times i uh, and so that is going to be what is returned and so now let's go and print out the result what's twice 128 well let's just go print learn of um, twice 128 is and we'll use our string interpolation again twice of 128. Save that and if we run it we should get 256. And sure enough there it is. Okay. Exercise 2 lists. Let's uh, pop down and have a look at these. And um, I should apologize, I didn't really put the text in for this as clearly as I should have, it turned out. People weren't quite sure what comparisons they were doing. I said, check whether they have the same contents. And the easiest way is to convert one to another. Well, we can check whether the list equals the same list just by going uh, println of list equals equals same list. Let's see if their contents are equal. Run that. And yes, they are. And well, let's see whether the content of the sequence is equal to the list. And here I was just trying to encourage you to um, explore the uh, methods that are available on sequence, for instance. And there is a method called uh, toList. Now, this also happily uh, answers a question that comes up on the forums occasionally, uh, which was is where I talked previously about how by convention in Scala, if you've got a method that takes no arguments and it has no side effects, you don't bother giving it open close brace. But if it has side effects, you do. Uh, and this is an, uh, an example of a method that has no side effects. This will return that sequence as a list, but it will not modify that sequence. It will just return um, a list. Uh, version of it. So there's no side effect, nothing has been changed apart from returning a value and so um, this has no side effect and by convention it doesn't have uh, open close brace at the end. And in fact in this case because of the way it's defined uh, it will say "Ooh, no it's defined as not having open uh, uh, open close brace. There's a, there's a different uh, to list if you like that it's probably going to think it is if you um, let's see if I do that that's going to, so there it is, without the open close brace. Uh, ooh, I need to head back to my code, that one there, right. Let's run that. And so that sequence to list is indeed the same as this contents. All right. Let's keep heading down. Um, then there was a little exercise in the syntax of lists, and this was having a look at this const operator, where if I go quote and I give it a, a, a head, and then the tail is a list, and so I can construct. Uh, if I give it a list, I can construct a new list that has spam at the front of it by saying, well, spam is the head and the tail is the org list. And so um, let's go and check whether the tails of spammer of something and blather of something are equal. Let's go val my test list equals list of, in this case, 789. Um, after the terrible old joke of um, why is 6 afraid of 7? Because 789. 
And let's then check whether spammer of my test list, which now should give me a new list with spam at the front of it. Um, oh, sorry, I said list of strings, didn't I? Not a list of ints, silly, silly me. Now that's happy. And let's check whether the tail of it is equal to the tail of my test list uh, passed through blather. And mm, to see the output, I'm going to need to print that out again, aren't I? Were, were they equal? And let's just insert that in there like so. And let's run this. Yes, they were. So unsurprisingly, if we stick different heads on them, but then we only look at their tails, it's going to reckon it's the same list. Uh, OK, so that, that really is, um, so far, these exercises are really just getting you to prod bits of syntax and have seen them before. It's, it's all familiarity, exer uh, familiarity exercises. Let's have a look now at tuples. And so this is this immutable data type. Um, that has two values and it is typed and so uh, I said that there's two notations for this there's one that uses brackets and there's one that uses an arrow let's check that um, the two notations are the same are the two notations equivalent and let's check that one comma two equals equals one arrow two And yes, they were. OK. Right, now let's pop down. And this is where I introduce these maps. So maps let you have a key and a value. So on this, uh, we've, we've set up a map using, uh, and if you recall, um, this, so this is making a call onto map, and uh, it's syntactic sugar for map.apply. Uh, which map.apply, and I give it the keys and the values as tuples, we'll put those into the maps. Um, so this is then going to give something that, for instance, if I were to say print learn of map of 1, I should get A. And if I was to go print learn of map of 2, I should get B. Um, so a, a map from keys to values. Um, but the thing I was going to say here is that, uh, well, Unlike in many other languages, in Scala by default the collections are immutable. Um, so I can't say map of 1 equals C um, because it's going to give you a red squiggly un underline and no, 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 this is an immutable map. I cannot change what one points to and I cannot just even add a new one uh, that way um, uh, because this is an immutable map. However, if I want to return this map updated with a new key value pair, there is a method that will return me a new map with whatever changes I want. I can say map.updated of, uh, say, uh, 1 goes to C if I wanted. Um, but it's not going to change this map. It's going to produce me a new map with the contents of the old map except that one now points to C. And so I can do that similarly for, well, I sort of could do it for V goes to S, except it's going to complain that um, it wants an integer and I've given it a string. And the reason here is I've not given this a type annotation. And so it has inferred the type of my map. And it has inferred that my map is a map of integers to strings. And now I'm trying to give it a string as its key. So what I could do is I could go up here and I could put an explicit type annotation saying, no, 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 this is a map from any old thing as its key uh, to string as its value. And now that's all going to be happy. Uh, but at the moment, of course, I'm still getting the map and I'm just throwing it away. So I'd, I'd sort of I'd ideally like to... Uh, remember it somewhere and so I could do that. 
Uh, now the note at the bottom says, and now don't do that again because normally we don't want inconsistent key types in our maps. It might seem a little bit silly to have a map from any, we're not sure what, uh, to a string. Why didn't I do it the other way around? Because usually we want to know what our key type is, but sometimes we can want to put different things as the value type. Uh, well, if I swapped the problem around, um, actually this sort of wouldn't, uh, the, the, the problem would slightly go away. Suppose instead, I don't want to put uh, V to S. Suppose I want to put, um, still with an integer as the key, uh, but I want to put a number as the value. Uh, if I go map.updated of 6, 127, um, it's actually going to work. And the reason is it's not returning this particular map. It's returning it updated uh, with an extra mapping. And if we look at how that updated method is defined, uh, it's defined as being generic on its value type. And so in this particular case, the way that the Scala type inference will work is it will say, oh, OK, yeah, you want one which has a common um, a common supertype of 127 uh, of, of an int and of a string as as your map. And so altered map. And if I have a look at what the type of altered map is, uh, in fact, it's now automatically given me a map of int to any. Um, but that map.updated, it is only generic. Uh, it only takes a type parameter for the value type. It doesn't take a type parameter for the key type. So when I wanted to set a problem showing you that the type inference will sometimes choose a narrow type if you don't specify it, I needed to do that on the key type. Um, because they've already thought of the idea of, well, actually, you get a map and you want to put a, 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 a something different in its value. And the way they do that is by having a, the updated uh, method take a type parameter for the value. OK, that was possibly a slightly long explanation. And especially for week one, uh, diving into that much gory detail, my goodness, I probably got three students at least who are going, mm, what, what, what are you waffling about, Will? All right, let's let's skip on because the main part of this is just about uh, getting familiar with the syntax, doing a little bit of stuff in um, Scala language. So, for instance, what we need to know from that that's a tuple, that's a tuple, and the map has a method map dot apply that can take a list of tuples and that'll set that up as a map. And there's also map dot updated that will give you a modified map. All right, let's skip on. As an icebreaker, try putting the fizzbuzz code from the lecture in here and print out the numbers from 1 to 100. Uh, so let's pop back here and let's go and get that fizzbuzz code. And this is, um, uh, again, well, this is just getting you to see a while loop running in your code uh, because the later ones where we're doing things imperatively, because we haven't come across the, um, the functional solutions yet, Oops, sorry, I accidentally bumped my mouse and it changed slides. Let's copy that code. And uh, so you might find that you need to use a while loop for some of it. So let us paste that in and let's just run it. And so, well, first thing we find is that we get a little, um, a little error comes up because I here, uh, well, I've already used I in this exercise. I used I all the way up here. And um, what we're going to do, since um, that one's shorter, so let's remove that code. Let's pop up here and let's show you a bit of the Scala IDE. I'm going to click that and I'm going to go refactor, rename, and let's say, let's just call that my variable. Actually, sorry, no, my value because of uh, what that one is. And so that has renamed it both where I defined it and where it was called. And now I should be able to pop back down here. And if I paste my code in, uh, I is not being used and that's no longer complaining. And so let's go and rerun our tests. Uh, oops, uh, sorry. Run.
and here we have all our fizzbuzzes being printed out. And like I say, that really just gets you to paste some of the code from the uh, from the lecture into the tutorial, and means that when you get down here, uh, you happen to have a uh, have the code for a while loop sitting just above you. Now, those of you who were eagle-eyed might notice that when I first checked these in, uh, I accidentally left the really short solution to the first one in the code. Um, let's show you the really short solution in case you missed it. Uh, if we just go r dot map of underscore times two, uh, I mean that, that's not just a one-liner. That is a really short one-liner. That will work. But but that's functional, and we haven't done the functional le lecture yet. So let's just do this as if it was, uh, for instance, in Java. And so what we want to do. Um, uh, we would like to print out an array uh, where every int has been doubled and so let's start off we can say uh, result array is new array of int um, of r.length and something to mention here notice here that we've got the new uh, if we happened to do that, unfortunately, this would be array.apply of r.length, and we would get an array with one element in it, which is the length of the other array. Uh, whereas if we do new array of r.length, we're calling the constructor, and it's going to treat that um, argument as being the length of the array that we want to declare. Uh, sometimes things like that can make a difference and uh, sometimes students can kind of, if you like, trip over a, something that is fairly small and is just from not noticing that um, a different piece of code is in there and perhaps, if you like, interpreting that piece of code the wrong way. All right, now we haven't done uh, the for loops in, um, in Scala. Well, Scala doesn't really have a for loop. It does something special with a for keyword. Uh, but we have done while loops and we pasted one in just up here and so let's do this with a while loop uh, let's go var uh, i equal zero uh, that's all right this is gonna this is gonna say oh by the way um, well at the moment it's just saying it's never used but that is going to shadow this variable so i in this local scope is not going to be the same i as up here I would have to be a little bit careful because if I didn't say i equals zero, if I just started referring to i, it might start referring to this one. Um, while i is less than r dot length, and let's say result array of i uh, equals array of i times two. And we need to remember to increment i, and as some students will notice, um, there isn't that one. Uh, instead, i plus equals 1. And the return type of a while loop is unit, so we're going to at the moment have a complaint saying we're not returning to anything. In Java, you would then say return result array. Um, but because Scala is expression oriented and the type of a block uh, so, you know, the result of a block is the result of the last statement in that block. We can omit the return. And now if I run that, I should find I have one less failing test. And where are we? I am just going to pop up here and I'm going to remove the while the that, that fizzbuzz stuff is going to get in the way. Uh, if I print it out every time, but we uh, up here it now says only four failed, um, so that particular test is now passing. Okay, so let's do the next one because the second one is saying an implementation is missing. This uh, this triple question mark, by the way, is just to throw a not implemented error. Um, so it's, it, it is the equivalent of saying that this function body is throw new not implemented error. Um, all right, so let's do this one. And this one is very, very similar, except that instead of multiplying it by 2, we want to multiply it by the index of the array. Sometimes get questions, how do I get the index of that array? Uh, well, because of the way that we happen to have set this one up, uh, i is our index into the array, and so all we need to do is multiply by i. And this should work. Um, 
Now, that might seem like a very uninteresting te uh, test um, because, you know, we've just changed it from times 2 to times by i. When we do this functionally, the difference between these two is going to become more interesting. OK, um, so what I'm going to do, uh, well, let's show it to you now. Uh, but realize that um, why this is the case is going to come up a little bit later on. Uh, though some students, uh, of course, get very well and uh, good ahead of, ahead of the game and will have done this this week as well. Um, R dot map, uh, it takes a lambda, it takes a function and it applies that function to every element in the array and returns, well, an array with that function applied to each of the elements. And so that is why I can say apply that to, and let's use the full lambda notation and let's go x goes to x times 2. And so that is why this map works. Now it happens to be that in Scala there's some syntax sugar that you can just say, well this has got one, one argument and I'm only referring it to it once. And so I can do that. Now the problem comes that if we pop down and try and do that functional solution to the second one, um, so then we're going to want to, if you like, go r dot map of underscore times blast. We don't have i. We don't have the index into the position. And so this is why this one becomes a little bit more interesting from a functional perspective, because it means that we have to do something to the array first so that when we call our map we're going to have the index that we want to multiply the number by. Uh, but I will show you that when we talk about uh, functional solutions to these uh, because otherwise if I digress too much it's going to be a little bit confusing for those who maybe aren't quite there yet. All right so let's have a look at the list one. Well the list one uh, this is, if you like, a little bit of practice in remembering that you can reuse things you did earlier. Uh, so how do we double a list? Uh, we've got a method for doubling an array, and okay, I've replaced it with a functional solution at the moment, but you remember the while loop, the while loop worked. Uh, well, what if we just do a bit of converting? Uh, what if we go double array of r dot to array, and then convert it back to a list at the end? And it worked. Um, oops, hang on. Three failed. Which one has failed? Oh, times position has failed, of course, because I've rem I've removed that one. Um, let's let us let us put that one back in so we can we can see it passing. And so what was it? It was value um, result array, uh, and that's an array of ints. Uh, is new array of r dot length, um, and var i equals zero while i is less than r dot length oops length uh, result array of i equals array of i times i i plus oops i plus equals my typing is a bit iffy today isn't it result array okay and uh, let's run that and so we should now have three of these passing And so we're now down to two failed. So let's skip on to uh, skip on to the next one. Uh, matching letters. Now, this one you could argue that I've actually not done my uh, test brilliantly here for this one, uh, which we will see in a moment. Um, so for this one, let's uh, we've got a word A as a string, a word B as a string, and uh, we can actually because word A has a method called char at, we can kind of treat it as if those are arrays of characters. And so we can say, for instance, var i equals zero while i is less than word a dot length. And uh, now there's a trick here. Um, 
lots of students in the tutorial would do that and then they would nest their um, while j is less than word a uh, sorry word b dot length um, inside um, the problem is it turns out it's really easy to forget to reset j at the end of the loop and you can end up in this situation uh, where well, let's go and fall into this trap um, if uh, where word a dot character at of i equals equals word b dot character at of j and where do we want to put this well we want to put this into a list and so let's go var result list and this is going to be a list of tuples of int to int and we'll start off with a, a list being empty and we'll just say that the result list uh, equals and we will add the tuple of i to j to the beginning of our result list and then at the end we need to return the result list now when we do that we're going to find that will fail and the problem is that the first time we go through um, this loop for j we are incrementing it uh, but then the set we increment i but we never reset j and so we're just going to find that blast um, it, it, it's not going to work and in fact in this case of course it's going to give me uh, an infinite loop because I've not actually put the code in for incrementing uh, either i or j um, but so let's solve both of these so let's put the declaration of j inside the loop so that's always going to be zero at the start of the loop and let's uh, increment i there and let's increment j there now if we run this we will probably find the problem of my badly written test so it's going to come up here and we're going to say list of tuples that this list isn't equal to that list but if we look at their contents we will see that 3 1 3 1 3 2 3 2 4 3 4 3 ah the problem is that my test is order dependent my test is saying you've got to return them in exactly this order and I haven't really specified in the function definition what order that is so that is oops badly written test uh, in this particular case we can fix it just by reversing the list at the end um, but ideally perhaps what I should do is make sure that my test didn't just test that the list was exactly the same it checked it should test that it has the same contents and so maybe what I should be t um, testing is instead of matching letters I should maybe turn that into a set and compare it to uh, a set uh, so that the order of its contents doesn't matter uh, so many apologies that was a poorly written test on my part And now four of five 